Hey everyone, this is going to be the lecture over the structure and function of the respiratory system. This lecture is going to be kind of fast, so if you need to pause it in order to make sure you've got everything written down, feel free to do so. So we have many functions for the respiratory system. The first two are very obvious. Uh, we're getting oxygen from the environment while getting rid of the carbon dioxide that our body produces during cellular respiration. We're also going to try to filter out any foreign particles. That way we're not getting a ton of gunk into our lungs. We're regulating the water content as it's going into our lungs so that way it's nice and humid so the diffusion can happen easier. We're creating the vocal sounds, which I'm doing right now. We're also contributing to the sense of smell, which once again is where that water kind of comes in. It's really going to help with that diffusion and the connection with the olfactory system. And finally, it helps regulate your blood pH. Uh, we're going to be talking about this a lot more later on, but carbon dioxide, when dissolved with water, makes an acid. So the more carbon dioxide you have in your blood, the more acidic your blood is. So we have uh, many different functions here, getting oxygen, getting rid of carbon dioxide. We're filtering out particles while making the air nice and warm and wet for our lungs. We're creating vocal sounds. We're contributing to the sense of smell and kind of taste. And we're also regulating the pH of your blood. So we have uh, many different steps for respiration as well. And I want to break this down because it's not always super common to think about this because it's going a lot more in depth than just your lungs. So we have breathing or ventilation, which is where you are moving air into and out of your lungs. So that requires a lot of muscle. That's where we have those intercostal muscles in between your ribs as well as your diaphragm that's going to assist in getting air in and out. We also have external respiration. And this is when we are exchanging gases with the environment. So that is what's happening in your lungs. We are getting oxygen going into your lungs and carbon dioxide out of your lungs. Then we take those gases to your cells. So for the case of oxygen, we're grabbing the oxygen in your lungs and we are going through the left side of the heart all the way through the body and then dropping off that oxygen. Once the oxygen gets to your cells, it diffuses through them and eventually is what is used during cellular respiration. So that internal respiration is when we're getting those gases to the cells and then cellular respiration with glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain is what we talked about earlier in this year. And that's when those oxygen uh, molecules are finally used. Now, if we're looking at carbon dioxide, it's essentially this whole step backwards. We're doing cellular respiration, we're producing carbon dioxide during the uh, Krebs cycle. Eventually, that diffuses into the blood, it gets transported back into your lungs, and then eventually you breathe it out. So, you have two main divisions of the respiratory system. I am going to say that there is a part that is disputed uh, by a lot of practitioners, but it really doesn't matter as long as you know where it's at. Uh, so, the upper respiratory tract, nose, nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses, pharynx, and we're going to be talking about a lot of those more later on. The lower respiratory tract technically includes the larynx, the trachea, bronchial tree, and the lungs. Now, where it gets a little tricky is that some... Um, Medical groups and organizations will say that the larynx is part of the upper respiratory tract. The larynx is right here. It's the top. It's a part of your vocal cords. Some people will say that the larynx is part of the upper respiratory tract, while others will say it's part of the lower. Really, it doesn't matter that much, just as long as you know that it exists and what it does. So, diving into the upper respiratory tract. First, we have the nose. Now, I put this up here. Uh, because it is debated about whether Kylie Jenner got her nose done, but looking at the before and after, I think that she probably had some work done within the nose department, along with a ton of other things, right? If I were a billionaire, I'd probably look like that too. So we have bone and cartilage that goes into your nose, and this is what helps support the structure. Now, the nostrils openings, entry for air, please don't stick anything up there. And your nose hairs are going to contribute to that filtering uh, mechanism that we talked about earlier. It's going to help protect you from getting any really large particles down into your airway. Uh, the sooner we can filter that out, the better it's going to be for you. Uh, humans are in a lot of nasty environments and anything we can do to filter and clean uh, the air that before it goes into your lungs, the better we're going to be. Um, we've seen lots of different nose constructions. There's a big uh, plastic surgery area where you can actually go in, and if someone has had a nose job but it went wrong, there's a lot of money in going in and actually trying to 
fix that nose. And what people will end up doing is if someone had a really bad nose job, like this poor woman here, the nose collapsed in on itself. And because it's made primarily of bone and cartilage, they can go in and retrieve cartilage from your rib cage and bring that back up in order to help bridge and support and give that nose shape again. So there's a lot of money to be made there. Um, it really just depends depends on whether that's something that you're interested in, but I think it's fascinating to see how um, extreme people will go in order to shape the way that they look. So as you may have seen in some of the COVID-19 testing, uh, people will go in with like these massive Q-tips and then literally just like shove them into their nose. And it's like it goes back farther and farther and farther. Now I do wanna say that there is no way that you are going to hit your brain if you stick something up into your nose. There are lots of bones in place there in order to make sure that when you stick something back there, you are not tickling your brain. Now what they've done is when they go in with that q-tip it goes all the way back they're trying to tickle this region of your nasal cavity that way they can get the most accurate amount of like if there is a virus there present they are looking for any of those markers there so um, your nasal cavity is really big and it's really open and it's really deep which is kind of gross essentially as far back as your mouth goes that's how deep your nasal cavity is so this nasal cavity, it's the hollow space behind the bone. You have a septum, which is going to divide the left and the right portion of your nose. And you also have these things called nasal conch. And they are like these little projections within your nose that are just going to help increase surface area. So it makes it more likely that the air going into your nose is going to be filtered, is going to be warmed by the blood and everything else in there as well as getting a little bit wet so that by the time it goes into your lungs, it's not super dry and irritating. Uh, the lining of your nasal cavity, we have a lot of those pseudostratified epithelial cells with the cilia on them, and those are gonna secrete a ton of different mucus in order to once again warm up the air and trap any debris or pathogens so that you don't get sick from all of the crud that could be getting into your body. So these particles are trapped and moved out. A lot of stuff, if you're not sick, um, it'll just be like pushed to the back of your nasal cavity and eventually you'll just end up swallowing it or if you're really sick, you might have a runny nose and it's coming out of this way or once again, draining back into your throat. Paranasal sinuses. These are air filled sacs within your skull. Now, this seems kind of strange. You have them here, here, and here. And a sinus is any hollow, empty cavity. Now, these are here literally just to make your head a little bit lighter. Um, bone is really dense and can be really heavy. Now, because you do already have a lot going on here with your brain and your face and all of your other senses, anything that we can do to lighten that load is going to make it easier on your neck and help reduce any strain of muscles later on. Um, these paranasal sinuses can also affect the sound of your voice um, and yeah they just help make your skull lighter okay so the pharynx uh, this is the back of the nasal cavity as well as the back of the mouth and the throat now the pharynx is divided into three areas and you can kind of see that with the green yellow and blue we have the nasopharynx which is in the back of the nose and this is once again where those q-tips are going to be going we have the oropharynx oro as an oral like mouth and then the hypopharynx uh, which hypo just means like below and so this is the lowest portion of the pharynx now we also have another name for hypopharynx because science is confusing and they like to switch things up on you we also call this the laryngeopharynx laryngeopharynx coming from the larynx here so we have the pharynx which is going to be the back top portion and that's like where all of the mucus is going to drain and whenever you swallow like stuff goes back there and then you also have the larynx which is going to be the top of the trachea which we're going to be talking about next now you have several openings into this area. You have the oral cavity, you have the nasal cavity, you have your esophagus, which is posterior to the trachea. And um, this is one of the reasons why if you are drinking water and someone makes you laugh, you can laugh and that air is being pushed up and out. And so that means you're gonna have a lot of force going up and out. And then if it goes into the oropharynx, all of that air coming up and out is going to push it 
into the nasal cavity and that's when the water comes out your nose or milk or whatever it was that you were drinking at the time. So the lower respiratory tract. Now we're talking about the pharynx. And once again, this is that kind of like hotly contested thing. Uh, some people believe that the larynx is part of the upper respiratory tract. Others believe it's part of the lower. It really does not matter, just as long as you know what the larynx is. So the larynx, it is the enlargement at the beginning of the trachea. If you are a male, it is more likely that you can see your larynx. It's where that Adam's apple is found. So it is a framework of muscle cartilage bound by elastic tissue, and this is ultimately what gives rise to your voice and being able to breathe, speak, as well as not make sure that like food gets down your trachea. That's, that's not healthy. So we have three different types of cartilage there. We have the thyroid, cricoid, and epiglottic. Uh, the most important one is the epiglottic, and we're going to be talking about that later on. But these two things are going to help make your voice box. So uh, if you were to make an incision and open this up, this is likely what you would see. This is the anterior side, and this is the posterior side. Oh, and look, there's that hyoid bone. We talked about that in the skeletal system. If someone is strangled and it's really violent, it's likely that the hyoid bone is broken during that, and so that's something that like um, forensic pathologists will use in order to figure out how someone died. So we have the thyroid cartilage here, and this is what ultimately gives rise to the Adam's apple. If you have higher levels of testosterone, it's more likely that this will appear, hence why males will have more of a present uh, Adam's apple than females. Uh, the cricoid cartilage is going to be right there, and that's what attaches the larynx to the trachea. And um, up here we have the epiglottic, and you can kind of see the epiglottic cartilage there. And this is going to be what prevents food from going down into your trachea. So your vocal cords. Uh, we are looking at a superior view, so it's like we've taken the larynx out and we are now looking down the larynx. So if you were to take a small camera and put that all the way back to your oropharynx and down into the laryngeopharynx, uh, that's where you're going to be finding vocal cords. Now, while we're looking at that, um, your vocal cords are found in the larynx. We have the false vocal cords and we have the true vocal cords. The only difference is that the false vocal cords are really just going to make sure that your airway is either opened or closed, and the true vocal cords are what are actually going to vibrate and then create the noise that is your voice. Um, what I need you to know is just that the vocal cords are found in the larynx. I'm not going to be asking you about differences between the true and the false. So the larynx is so that enlargement up at the top, and it contains the epiglottis, and this is very important. This contains, uh, it, this is the cartilage that is going to block any food or drink from going down into the trachea. So looking at this, the epiglottis is going to be that flap, and whenever you swallow, this epiglottis is going to cover that opening that we saw in the last one. It's gonna cover this opening right here, and that way nothing can get down into you um, into your respiratory system that doesn't belong. Um, so then we have the epiglottis. Epi means on or above. And so we also have the glottis. And the glottis is nothing more than a space or opening just like your pupils. And this is what's found in between the vocal cords. And the glottis, it's that triangular opening in between the vocal cords. And this is where air, and only air, hopefully, is going to go down and into your trachea. So the glottis is that opening that air is going to pass through the larynx and into the trachea, and the epiglottis is going to block that. So let's say you have uh, laryngitis. I had this a couple years ago and I literally could not speak. I was like whispering to everyone. It was a really tough time. Uh, but laryngitis is inflammation of the larynx and people end up losing the ability to speak because everything is so inflamed that those true vocal cords cannot vibrate properly and so you don't get any uh, production of sound in the end. Okay, we're gonna be moving on to the trachea as well as the lungs and the alveoli next. Uh, so go ahead and stop this video and I will see you for the next.